Welcome and good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Photo Justice Photo Moment. Today is Tuesday, the 27th of September. And today's Photo Moment, live to you, of course, on the Facebook Live at 9.30 a.m. Pacific every weekday. Be sure you tune in live when you can. It's awesome to see you guys here live and commenting live. Today's Photo Moment is answering a question of Mr. Javier de, de Coral. Thank you, Javier, for sending in this question, who is participating live. Thank you and welcome again. His question was, why mirrorless? That's a pretty good question. You know, why would you go mirrorless? In fact, let me pull up the notes because he did send me a little bit more detail than simply why mirrorless. And I do have that here. He says, all right, Javier wrote it. Uh, I want to propose a topic. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been thinking of getting one, a mirrorless camera. I would love to hear your experience as a professional and the uses you give them, image quality, advantages other than weight, disadvantages, feel, etc. My interest comes more from a traveling point of view. Excellent. Uh, I have a Nikon 7000, which I don't know what the size that is, but I'm going to guess it's roughly the same as these things with a couple of big lenses, and I find that sometimes it's hard to travel, hike, and carry the backpack. I'm not a professional at all, but I do love photography. So, perfect. That's that you are the target market, my friend, for mirrorless cameras. Um, it, of course, target market is also professionals and really kind of very beginner consumers. It's all over the place. But really, travel is a really, really great reason to be shooting with mirrorless cameras. And let me start by doing this. This is why... This is a great solution for travel. This. This tiny, tiny little bag. Obviously, you can buy bags from a thousand different manufacturers. This is kind of, this is ridiculous. This is the, um, who makes this thing again? I always forget the name of this company. Um, uh, Ona, Ona bags. These are, re you know, really nice, gorgeous leather bags. But point is, it's tiny. It's a tiny, tiny little bag. And what's in this tiny bag? Well, when I'm traveling, I can pack a camera, three lenses, maybe even four, maybe a little backup body if I wanted to go with a small backup body. I can pack a ton of stuff into this tiny little bag. But of course, you don't need to pack a ton of stuff. A camera and maybe two or three lenses is all you're gonna need for the majority of your travel type work. And to be able to carry that around in something like this is wonderful. So that is the, I don't know, the number one reason, but one of the major, major reasons to go mirrorless, just size and weight. And just to kind of drive that point home here, I'm gonna get rid of the uh, lower third here because it's just blocking, blocking part of the picture here. Um, this is, okay, oh, I forget how heavy this thing is until I pick it up again. This is a Canon EOS 1DS, uh, what is this, Mark III. This was my primary shooting camera for a long time. This is a 70-200 f4.0 lens. This is the GX8, which is Lumix GX8, which is my current primary shooting camera. And it also has a 70 to 200 F4, uh, F2.8 lens on it. This is the F2.8. So this is an F4, that's an F2.8. Now there is some differences as far as the shallow depth of field that you get on um, on micro four thirds versus on, or well, any mirrorless really, versus a uh, full frame DSLR. So having the faster lens will allow you to get back some of that shallow depth of field that you lose. So I would say as far as bokeh is concerned, these two lenses are about equivalent. Um, size and weight, there, as far as that's concerned, not so much, pretty darn different. Uh, this thing will break your wrist, break your neck. This will be a pain in the neck. You will be spending money on the chiropractor, all of that good stuff with this. This you will not. So let's talk a little bit about history uh, before we get into details on the lenses. Uh, obviously, I used to shoot with this stuff. Still own it all. That's the Canon 5D size body. That's what this is. That's a 5D. This one's a Mark II. Um, that's the 1DS size body. Your Nikon D series would be equivalent of things like this. Your Nikon, or the big Ds with the D, 4D, whatever the heck, I don't know. The big Nikons, big Canons, um, all about the same size. When you go to mirrorless, there's a tremendous, tremendous difference in size and weight. But let's talk about why I went to start. It's actually a really cool story. So I, um, I have a friend who has a, um, a bit of a camera collector, and I knew he had um, a Leica S2, the medium format DSLR shaped camera. And if you saw my photo moment yesterday, I was showing some pictures, the sculpture series that I shot with that Leica camera. Um, and the Leica camera came from this friend. I asked if I could borrow this camera for a shoot for the sculpture series. So he shipped it to me, and he also threw in the bag a couple of other cameras because he's a bit of a collector. He said, here, I'm going out of town for a while, play with some of these. And there was a Fuji, I don't remember the model number, um, X something, I don't know, one of the Fuji 
mirrorless, of course, interchangeable lens cameras. This was, uh, what did I say yesterday? It was 2012, I think. So it was quite a few years ago, maybe 13. Anyway, um, beautiful camera, the Fuji. Beautiful, beautiful camera. And also in there was an Olympus OMD something or other, the first kind of real mirrorless micro four thirds DSLR type camera. And there were a couple lenses for that. There was one lens on the Fuji, a pretty wide lens, I think like a 28 millimeter equivalent or something like that, which really isn't my preferred focal length. Um, at least at the time it wasn't. Now I actually quite like the 30. Anyway, and, uh, and then the Leica. It might have been something else in there. Anyway, so I was playing, I shot with the Leica, obviously. I really wanted to play with the Fuji. I was really excited about the Fuji, but I only had the one lens, which was a bit of a bummer. And so I was shooting with that, and obviously shooting with the Leica. And at some point he calls me up and he says, hey, have you been you know, shooting with all the gear? I go, yeah, I love it, I love it. He goes, well, what do you think of the Olympus? I say, I, 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 haven't, I haven't shot with that. I go, look, it's, it's micro four thirds, man. And the sensor's like this big. I mean, come on. I'm a full frame shooter, right? That's, I was, I was an unabashed sensor snob. And I will... I'll tell you the reason for that. It's not just some, um, you know, made up thing. Years and years ago, when Aperture first came out, so now we're getting a side story to the side story. Um, years and years ago, when Aperture first came out, and I was first starting to shoot digital, um, and I was this is when I was at Apple. I was working on Aperture. I was shooting with a Canon 20D, I think that's the model, and that's an APS-C size sensor. And that was my first foray into real digital, not little point and shoot crappy things, but real digital cameras. And it was great. It was amazing, right? Loved it. Um, and then at the Aperture launch event in Photo Plus New York in 2005, I think that's right, I was looking at photos from another photographer, digital pictures. And I'm looking at them going, there's, there's something different. What is it about your photos that are different than mine, other than that you're an awesome professional photographer and, and I'm not? <laughs> um, there was something tangible about it that I couldn't quite figure out. And, uh, and he looks at me and goes, full frame. Oh, okay, what's full frame? So I had to figure that out, you know, look into that, uh, research it, understand it. Okay, now I get what full frame is. Immediately I became a sensor snob. I became a full frame sensor snob. Um, my next camera was a 5D, the original 5D, which was full frame and then moved up to the 1DS, which is obviously full frame as well. Big, huge, heavy cameras, same size sensor as 35 millimeter film. And I got it, that's the look. So when my buddy asked me if I was trying out that Olympus that he had sent, that OMD, I said, no, man, it's like, it's micro four thirds, man. That's tiny, I don't want that tiny little sensor. Um, it's basically a quarter of the size. I mean, come on. And he goes, dude, try it out. Trust me, give it a shot. Fine. So I start playing with it. I fell in love with that camera almost immediately. The focus was lightning fast. The low light performance, while good, not maybe not as good as the larger sensors in your um, you know, kind of low light professional environment. When I was at home with friends over, I remember we were sitting around playing I don't know, a card game or something, kind of low light, really low light, like candlelight kind of crap. And I pull out my camera and uh, I switch over to black and white mode and I fired off all these shots and I'm going, this is perfectly sharp. Yeah, it's noisy, but that's why I put it in black and white. You know, the cheating way to get rid of your noise is to put it in black and white and call it green. But the image quality was fantastic. I'm going, this is unbelievable. My Canon isn't focusing this fast in the low light. Um, it's obviously a much bigger, heavier thing. If you're sitting around the dinner table, you pull out one of these things, you know, what are we at a photo shoot? If I'm sitting around the dinner table and I pull this out, I'm gonna snap some pictures. So I really suddenly came to appreciate that. So then I played with it for a bit more and I, I really started to enjoy it. And then I decided to buy one. So I got that Olympus OMD, whatever the model was. And uh, I think, well, a lens to start. And then I bought another lens and another lens. and. Um, really came to appreciate the Micro Four Thirds. Now, at this, at this point, I was still shooting Canon. I was still shooting full frame for all my professional work. That Micro Four Thirds was an interesting experiment. And I started taking it on trips. And at some point, I did a, 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 pro, a client shoot. I think it was an event, a, a party or something like that. And I thought, you know, I'm going to be walking around this party for hours. Uh, I can carry a small bag with a couple of lenses. And by that point, I had enough lenses to do the job. Or I can carry a much bigger bag with much bigger lenses. And, you know, it's a, it's a backyard party if so it was a big anniversary party or something. I don't want to be there with this big honking gear. I want to have something smaller and lighter. So I shot with that and I loved all the images that came out of it. The client loved the images. Everybody was happy. So I'm like, okay, image quality wise, this is good enough. And eventually, once I started shooting with it more and more, in some cases, I found it actually be better. And I know that's kind of sacrilegious to say something like that, but uh, it was, I was having, I had been noticing that on one of my Canon lenses, one of my preferred lenses, it just seemed Lately, it was getting soft. And I thought, is there something wrong with the lens? Like, you know, did I, um, 
did I drop the lens? Is it just aging? I don't know what's going on. And I'm looking at it, calling it soft, comparing it to the image I was getting out of the Micro Four Thirds. And uh, eventually I went back to old photos. I'm wondering, okay, there's something wrong with my lens. So I'm gonna go back several years to photos I've been shooting with that lens. And they all looked that way. So it wasn't that the lens was getting worse. It was, I was becoming more critical of it. And looking at what I was getting out of the Olympus at the time just blew me away. So as I started to expand my lens lineup, uh, a lot of the lenses that I was buying were actually Panasonic lenses. And now this gets into one of the other beautiful things about the Micro Four Thirds specifically. So this is Micro Four Thirds, but you know, mirrorless obviously encompasses more than just this. With the Micro Four Thirds, you can have lenses from different manufacturers. The two biggies are, of course, Olympus and Panasonic. And I'm sponsored by Panasonic. I'm a Lumix luminary, uh, but that obviously came later. And at this point, I had the Olympus body, and I bought a um, a couple of Panasonic lenses. And I just I was preferring those lenses. Not that there's anything wrong with the Olympus lenses, just the lenses that I was wanting that had the focal length and the aperture combination that I wanted. I was finding on the Lumix side. So then. I started, you know, go, it's time to add a second body. Now it's time to really think about this. And um, do I do I move over towards the Panasonic side? For the most part, everything's compatible, but you're going to find some things that are going to work better if you've got Olympus and Olympus or Panasonic and Panasonic. So then I went to the GX7. I think that's right. Yeah, a Panasonic camera, Lumix camera. And by that point, I'm, I'm in. I'm just all in. And as I started... It, Around that time, I started talking to Panasonic, uh, started building the relationship that eventually turned into me being sponsored by them to being a luminary. But um, in the meantime, I was shooting more and more with this gear and less and less with this gear. And probably a couple of years ago, I'd say, uh, I made the switch completely. I think the last shoot that I did of, with these cameras was a ballerina in my studio almost three years ago. Yeah, it's coming up in three years ago. I think in January, it'll be three years. And the only reason that I was shooting with this camera at the time was because I could shoot tethered. And I had the client, um, makeup artist, and somebody else in the room, they all wanted to be able to see the pictures up there, so I was shooting tethered. Well, that was the only reason. Um, everything else I was shooting with the Micro Four Thirds gear. And obviously, I started to expand the gear, started to get more and more um, lenses, being sponsored obviously helps with that, getting more and more lenses, more cameras to choose from, and so on. So, okay, so now, other than they were awesome to work with, they're clearly smaller and lighter, what else do I like about them? Well, there's a lot of really interesting advantages that you get working with the tiny Micro Four Thirds or other mirrorless gear, um, other than the size and weight. One of the things on the Lumix specifically is the technology that is packed into these. One of my annoyances with the big camera manufacturers has long been that there are, these are basically built bare bones cameras with the minimal features, and then you can add other features to it. Like if you want to do time lapse, you got to buy a $150 adapter or something, a trigger remote to do time lapse. This stuff's time lapse built in. These cameras do HDR built in. These cameras have um, Wi Fi built in. They have so much cool tech built into them, and I'm a total tech geek, and they get better over time. It's kind of like if you're into cars, um, these days, you know, you can buy any car and the car that you buy is the car that you will own for the rest of that car's life. Or you can buy a Tesla and the Tesla will get software updates and the camera or the car gets better and better. This is like the Tesla of cameras. It gets better and better. I get new features a couple times a year when Panasonic releases firmware updates. So things like 4K photo and um, uh, in-camera photo merging to do focus stacking. Those are features that have come or are coming to these cameras as software updates. It's phenomenal. So you buy the camera and you keep getting more and more stuff showing up, which is just so, so cool. So that's one of the big things that I like about them. So, okay, now let's talk about something else about the size. All right, so this, let's just get rid of these things. These are monstrous. Oh, actually, before I do that, let's do a top down quick. I did set up this, not top down, but this angle camera, just so I can make sure we're really seeing, um, let's go, let's go for my GX8, my workhorse camera, there we go, versus, oh, man, this thing's heavy, versus the Canon. Um, Get that into the lens view. All right, come on, move out of there. There we go. Let's just do it like that. Big, big differences. This is, oh, and by the way, here, we should probably just make this fair. Let's take this thing off of here. I'll talk about this lens in a moment. Let's put this lens on here because that's the equivalent. There we go. Now we're talking. Let's take the lens shade off so we're totally even. There we go. There's your difference in cameras. That's, it's just, it's a massive, massive difference. There's no, no debating this. That is a massive, massive difference. Okay, so there's that. Um, let's talk 
Let's talk lenses and bodies. This is one of the really cool things about the Micro Four Thirds system, or any mirrorless, any mirrorless. Um, I'm scared. I'm gonna get rid of these things. I'm gonna get rid of this guy. Oh, good lord! I'm gonna hurt something. Get rid of that guy. Just not blocking the other camera. Nope. Okay, get rid of that. Uh, okay, here we go. So this is. Oh, I should have brought my Noctocron in. Anyway, I don't. So this is the. 70 to 200 equivalent. So this is a 35 to 100 f2.8, 70 to 200 equivalent camera uh, lens. Okay. And this obviously can go on this body. But then here's a slightly smaller body, the GX85. This is my current favorite travel camera. Love this guy. And then there's this guy, which is it's tiny, tiny little. This is the GM5. GM5, GM1, GM5. Lumix GM5, teeny tiny little thing. And I can take this tiny little body and put it on this big lens. Now, this is kind of silly. <laughs> It's a little silly, maybe, but you can do it. So if I want to take a tiny, tiny little camera body on a trip with me, but I want to bring that one lens, that really nice lens that I love so much, I can do that and I can give up some of that size. Now, the sensor size is exactly the same in these two cameras. There are tons of feature differences between them. There's different processors in these. This actually, being the GX8, has the newest sensor in it, which is actually a higher resolution sensor. It's, it's uh, no longer 16 megapixels and not 20 megapixels. So we get a little bit more resolution out of it. There's a lot of differences between them, but they are both micro four thirds cameras and you can use both any of the lenses on any of these bodies, which I, is something I just find to be fantastic. So that's, that's a really cool thing about it. Um, let's see, let's talk about one of the fundamental, I know I'm just bouncing all over the place here, but one of the fundamental differences between them is the electronic viewfinder versus the optical viewfinder. I think this is a really important thing to talk about because, uh, because it is one of the real fundamental differences here. So let's go back to this view. This camera, maybe it has a battery in it. No, the battery's dead on this. Um, this camera obviously has a mirror. You can see the mirror in there. So that means that when you're looking through the lens, through the lens, um, light's coming through the lens, hits the mirror, bounces up, hits the pentaprism, bounces off the pentaprism, and comes out through the viewfinder. All right, that's how that works. All right, this camera is a, there's no mirror. So the, the sensor is always exposed. The sensor is always reading the image. And what you're seeing on either the LCD panel in the back or in the viewfinder, and this is an electronic viewfinder, it's called an EVF or electronic viewfinder, what you're seeing is exactly what the sensor is seeing. Not what's being bounced through a bunch of mirrors, but it's seeing what the sensor is seeing. So you're going to see exactly the photo that you're getting. Now, it's one of the huge advantages of this, things that I love, is that I can dial in a look on my camera. This goes for all mirrorless cameras. You can dial in a look on the camera. You can dial in the contrast, the the S curve on the um, uh, on the curves. You can dial in an S curve on there if you want. You know, take the shadows down or up or highlights up or down, whatever you like. Change the color saturation. Change the sharpness even. Go to black and white, and you can see all of these things when you're looking through the viewfinder. You see the heck. Sorry, you see exactly what your photo is going to look like. If I take the exposure down a little bit, underexposed by a stop, overexposed by a third of a stop. I'm gonna see that in real time through the viewfinder. You don't get any of that on this until you actually take the picture. Back in the old days, and by that I mean a decade or so ago, if you looked at electronic viewfinders, they were awful, awful. You had a significant shutter lag, a uh, significant view lag, I don't know what it's called. Anyway, lag between what was happening in the real world and what you were seeing. Um, the, the viewfinders were dim, so they were kind of hard to see, unless you had a really, really bright situation, it'd be kind of hard to see what you're saying. Um, low resolution, so it, it wouldn't look as sharp. These are all problems that you had looking through old electronic viewfinders. When you compared that to an optical viewfinder, it was like a night and day difference. You're going, oh my God, it's why would I ever look at electronic? It's so much brighter and easier to see on the optical, yada, yada. But then these got better, significantly better. And now I can do things like I can see more through this viewfinder than I can through this one because I'm seeing an enhanced version of reality. If I want to increase the exposure, I can see that through the viewfinder. I can even preview not only depth of field, but I can also preview shutter blur, uh, motion blur through a slower shutter speed. So if I'm shooting at, let's say, 30th of a second or 15th of a second, I can actually choose, choose, I can choose to see that motion blur through the through the viewfinder on this camera. It's fantastic. It's really, really, really cool. So that's one of the big, big differences between a mirror camera 
optical path and a mirrorless camera with a digital or electronic path. So, um, hey, Sean Robinson, shout out to you, one of my buddies from Panasonic. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and Javier, yeah, the viewfinder thing is, it's a huge, huge, huge difference. Now, the one area where view, electronic viewfinders can still be lacking is in really high speed motion sports type stuff. These are getting better and better all the time at it. Now, I am not a sports photographer. Occasionally, I'll point the camera at something moving quickly, um, but I don't shoot that way all the time. If your career is being a sports photographer, you're on the sidelines of the big football game, whatever, then you would need to do some comparison shopping and really decide, is this is this really the, uh, the right camera for me? Uh, in many cases, I think, you know, you look at the big NFL games, whatever, it, they're all still shooting gear like this. But as this technology is getting better, it is getting better, it's gotten a lot better, uh, you may find that it works for you. That, I'll just leave it at that, and from there you need to uh, do your own investigating. But other than that fastest of motion, sports game kind of thing, um, other than that, it's, it's, in my opinion, better than what you're going to get out of a camera like this. Now, there are other advantages to shooting with this for things like sports. Like I was just watching, I wish, wish I remember the chap's name now. Um, I was looking at an image that was shot at, uh, at the Olympics by someone with a Lumix camera. It was with one of these guys. I don't remember which model, but whatever, one of these guys. And they shot with something called 4K photo mode. Now, 4K photo mode is something that you only, this is a, a Panasonic Lumix thing. Um, I don't know if other mirrorless manufacturers have come up with anything equivalent, but, um, but 4K photo is shooting 4K video, but at, so at 30 frames per second, that's your video, 30 frames per second, um, but you're shooting at a high shutter speed so that you can extract a frame from it. And 4K photo is eight megapixels. So you can get 30 frames per second, eight megapixels. And that'll allow you to have a much higher opportunity of getting that, that pristine moment in a sporting event where the differences are the fingers uh, you know, away from the ball or touching the ball or whatever, that, that tiny little fraction of a time difference. And that 4K photo idea is getting better and better. Panasonic just announced uh, development of the GH5, the next generation highest end camera, and that one's going to have a 6K version of that, which I, th I think is 18 megapixels, something like that. It's, it's huge. It's insane. So it's where the whole sports thing is getting more and more exciting to go with this. Um, Javier, you asked, uh, you asked, does it feel natural? I always prefer shooting through the viewfinder. You're talking about looking through here. It's, it's, there's an adjustment. There absolutely is an adjustment period because you are, you are used to looking through this viewfinder at this optical view. Um, but once you get used to it, there's no going back. That's that's what I would say about that. The amount of information you can get, I can see a, a live histogram through this viewfinder while I'm looking at the image. And I mean, I mean put my eye up to the viewfinder. This is a this viewfinder is it's the exact same data that I'm going to see on the back of the screen here. I can see the exact same thing between here and here. How do I want to look? Do I want to put my my eye up to it straight? Do I want to put my eye down at an angle like this? And this the GX8 is the only one that does this. I love this feature. Um, or do I want to have the LCD panel flat on the back? Do I want to have it turned out? Do I want to have it turned up so I can go down like this? Do I want to have it up above so I can go above my head? Lots of different ways, lots of different ways. Sean's uh, telling me that the GS GH5 is going to do 4K photo at 60 frames per second. So so 8 megapixel, 8 megapixel stills at 60 frames per second. That's insane. Insane. So very, very cool. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's the viewfinder thing. The, the extra information you get out of it is phenomenal. Okay. Whew, man, I'm, I'm really all over the place here. Um, I wanted to show, I was talking about lenses and how you can get lenses from different manufacturers. This is specifically to the Micro Four Thirds mount. I, one of my favorite lenses is, where'd it go? Oh, right here. This is not a Lumix lens. This is made by a Chinese company called uh, Zhang Yi and it's called the Speedmaster. And this is a 25 millimeter, so a 50 millimeter equivalent, F0.95. <laughs> F0.95. The shallow depth, of, this is insanely shallow depth of field on this thing, which means great low light gathering capability, and it means incredible bokeh when that's what you're looking for. Now, that is a 50 millimeter F.95 micro four thirds lens. This, by the way, is a completely manual lens, manual focus, manual aperture ring, and you know what? I love it. I love it. Okay, anyway, so there's that. This is the 50 millimeter f1.2 Canon lens. I'm just going to leave that right there. Get this stuff out of the way so you can see it. 50 millimeter f1.2 
50 millimeter f.95, 0 0.95. Look at that, it's a huge difference in size and weight. It's insane. This used to be my favorite lens. This was, it is an amazing lens. It's absolutely gorgeous, but it also weighs a ton. This does not. This is a fantastic, tiny little, very lightweight, very portable, very easy to take with you lens. So my travel combination is going to be, and is, this is what I take when I hit the road now. GX85, beautiful, beautiful camera. This is the one that I did the, uh, the video in New Orleans on for Panasonic. Uh, that when I went on that shoot, that was the first time I had ever seen this camera. Uh, you know, I got it a couple days before I left for that gig and had to send it back. Very depressing. Finally got one once they started shipping. Absolutely love it. This is by far my favorite camera. I've shot weddings with this camera. Um, I'm not a wedding shooter, but I've shot a wedding with this camera. This is one of the big things on this is it has no anti-aliasing filter. So the images are even sharper. It does mean you might get more That's what you, that's what the anti-aliasing gains you is that uh, more killer, but for me, it's worth it to get the sharpness and I don't worry about the moray. It's fabulous. So this with the Zhongyi 50 mil equivalent 0.95 lens, this is a Leica. So let's take that off. So you're seeing the, the actual size of the lens. This is a Leica Lumix. This is Panasonic Lumix Leica branded lens. This is a 15 millimeter F 1.7. So that's a 30 mil equivalent. So there's your 30, a 30, a 50. And then if I'm trying to go really light, I will take uh, let's see, one of these two lenses, or maybe both, because you know what, frankly, they're tiny. So these two lenses here. This one, these are not your sharpest, best lenses in the lineup, but they're tiny. This is a 42 and a half millimeter F1.7. So it's an F1.7 portrait lens. You see that little guy there? So the 85 millimeter equivalent. And this is a zoom. This is a 70 to 200 F4 to 5.6. So it's quite slow, but look at how tiny that is. And when it expands out, you know, it, it grows up a little bit. Um, but this is a really nice, if I if I don't really expect to need a telephoto, but I don't want to be without one, this is a great lens to take. It's This will quite literally fit in your pocket. It's a tiny, tiny little thing. So my lineup for carrying, for hitting the road would be something like that right there. Get those guys out of the way. Let's get this thing out of the way, get that out of the way. And all of this is clearly going to fit with room to spare in this guy right there. That's a beautiful thing. Let's move that in a little bit. Get that back in frame. There we go. Look at that lineup. Look at that. Beautiful lineup there. That's, there you go. That's all you need. That's your gear. Leave this thing at home. Crazy. Madness. So there you go. That is my why mirrorless. Uh, you know, a lot of people are gonna have different opinions on why they love it, but I think universally you are seeing people, once they start playing with mirrorless, they love it. Whether you're talking about Panasonic or Olympus or Sony. Sony's making beautiful cameras as well. They actually have a full frame mirrorless, which is a little bit odd because it makes the camera body smaller, but the size of the lens is to, kind of tied to the size of the sensor. You can only have a marginally smaller lens if you still have to go full frame. Um, so you're not getting a huge advantage in size when you go to the Sony cameras. The bodies are smaller because they don't have to have the whole mirror pentaprism thing going on. Although most of these, a lot of these do end up still having a pentaprism for one reason or another, but it's not an actual, you know, with, they have a thing that looks like a pentaprism, let's put it that way. Uh, but the being the sensor still being as big as it is, the only real advantage is without the mirror, the body can be thinner, which means that the flange coming off the back of the camera can be smaller. If you look at that, uh, where, where do these bodies go? Here we go. If you look at the difference of how much the the shell, the what do you call this thing, the, the flange sticks out into the body, it's significantly more on this one than it is on this one. All of those low profile things you gain by going mirrorless, but it is the overall lens size is not going to be as small as it will be on the Micro Four Thirds. And then you got the Fuji lineup, which is beautiful, beautiful. They make some really, really nice cameras, really nice glass, and that is somewhere in between the size of this. Micro Four Thirds gear and the full frame size Sony gear. Uh, they're using APS-C size sensors, which are a little bigger than Micro Four Thirds, still smaller than full frame. So, you know, you gotta play with it, experiment, see what you like. Uh, I fell in love with this system and have been using it for years now. The uh, the Fuji stuff is, is beautiful. I know a lot of photographers who absolutely love their Fuji gear. I know a lot of photographers who absolutely love their Sony gear. So not knocking any of them. The only people to knock these days are these guys and Nikon because they are just not keeping up. They aren't doing anything interesting in this space. And frankly, that's sad because they're great companies with great legacy and great history to them. But where's the new tech? Where's the love? We're seeing it from these manufacturers, not from these. So anyway, that's that. That's my why mirrorless. That's a big, long why mirrorless rant, but hopefully 
that is interesting to you. Now, if you want to get your hands on some of these, hey, I'm going to I'm going to do a quick little pitch here. Um, don't forget, I do have this tour coming up, this Oaxacan Light Photography Tour slash Workshop coming up in. Uh, in January of next year, January 14th to 22nd, we're in Oaxaca, Mexico. It is a cultural tourism tour slash photography workshop. I will, needless to say, be bringing all of my fun Lumix gear. So if anyone wants to play with that while we're in Mexico, you can absolutely do it. I have no problem loaning my gear out, let people have a go with it. Um, hello, Scott. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to the show. Um, and uh, I think this is a, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're interested in this, head over to photojoseph.com slash workshops and you can uh, learn more about that and obviously sign up for it. Um, Scott, you say uh, what I see in the new Canon M5. So the Canon M5 is a mirrorless camera. Canon does not seem to be taking this thing very seriously. And it's, what is it, full frame or it's APS-C size and it uses the original lenses, right? And I think they've come out with a couple of new lenses for it, but it's lacking the tech, it's lacking the interest, it is still oversized, overpriced, and just not a fun camera. It is not this. And it's like they came out with one camera just like they say, look, we have mirrorless. Come on, guys, let's get serious about this. How many different APS-C Scott says? Okay, so it's smaller, it's the same as the smaller Canon bodies, um, and same as the Fuji. Uh, if you're gonna take this seriously, take it seriously. Let's see some love. Let's see a lineup like this and then maybe people will take it seriously. But honestly, I think it's just, the only reason that camera exists in my mind is they can have a bullet point and say, look, we do mirrorless. It's not really, it's, just, it's not, it's not this. So not that, it's definitely not that, get rid of that. It's not this. So that's it. Thanks a lot, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate everybody who watched live. Super cool, super fun. If you missed any of this, it'll be on the rebroadcast in just a few minutes as soon as Facebook is done with it. And of course, the easiest way to find all of these, if you want to go back through the archives, we started putting everything over on YouTube. So if you go to um, my YouTube page, you know, the easiest way is just go photojoseph.com slash moments. That'll redirect you to the YouTube playlist and you'll see all the videos there. We're up to 60 something of these now, or maybe 70, it's, it's getting up there. Uh, I'll have to figure out something fun for a hundredth one. Uh, and that's that, uh, yeah. 9.30 a.m. live every weekday here on Facebook at facebook.com slash photojoseph. Uh, if you missed any of it, photojoseph.com slash moments, and you'll find them all. That's it, guys. Take care. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.